to The Kill Count, where we tally up the victims in all our favorite horror movies and show you how they were made. I'm James A. Janice, and today we're looking at Hell House LLC, released in 2015. Hell House is a found footage film about five friends who turn an abandoned hotel into the ultimate haunt. The movie uses a documentary framing device, taking place years after Hell House's disastrous and deadly opening night. Though it was made well into the found footage boom that followed Paranormal Activity's success, Hell House LLC still manages to be refreshing and include a number of legendary scares. I think it's one of the most frightening found footage films, at least during a first time watch. You can see the seams of the story a bit more on subsequent viewings, but that initial experience is effectively terrifying. Hell House LLC never got a theatrical release, but became so popular on VOD that it spawned two sequels and a prequel that was released just a few months ago. For now, I'll only be looking at the original, but if the interest is there, we can check out the rest of the series later. When Hell House becomes a kill house, how many bodies is it liable for? Let's find out and get to them. The movie begins with an enticement. You want to know what I think happened that night? Yes, I do! I have no idea. Oh, okay. In 2009, after months of preparation, a haunt named Hell House had its opening night. It didn't go great, judging by this parade of news teams and emergency vehicles that wound up on site. Five years later, authorities still haven't released details about the incident, which killed 15 people. Hey, come on! Spoilers! Get that body bag out of here! I'll count them when we get to that point in the story. Reporter Diane Graves is hoping to elucidate things with a documentary, interviewing witnesses, and pouring over the only evidence available. A leaked 911 call only adds creepiness without any context. Please hurry, I don't want to die. And a recorded walkthrough uploaded to YouTube only shows that the place had awful bathrooms and uh, maybe a mosh going on in the basement. It isn't clear. I love this very real feeling YouTube video. It's scary without spoiling anything, but still gives you visual bookmarks that'll make a lot more sense later on. Is that supposed to happen? Local authorities tried to bury the whole thing, but years later, a photographer named Martin Cliver snuck into the building to snap some shots. It's fun to start piecing together a narrative based on his photos and the walkthrough video, but it's clear that whatever went wrong started in the basement. And Martin was too smart to investigate down there. I've seen a lot. Been to a lot of scary places in my career, and there was no way I was going down those stairs. I don't blame you, dude. These pictures alone are enough to creep me out. Diane's documentary gets a breakthrough when they're contacted by Sarah Hobble, the sole survivor of the team that put the haunt together. No one has seen her since the incident, but she's here now with a bunch of footage that has never been seen before. Everything that went on in the house was taped. Diane has one of her crew members start going through the tapes, and their footage will make up the bulk of the film. We meet the five members of Hell House LLC 46 days before the grand opening and closing of their haunt. They're led by the fearless and maybe negligent Alex, who decided that their haunt this year will take place in an abandoned hotel. He's excited about the place's authenticity, but the others are concerned about logistics, since they only have seven weeks and this place is basically a teardown. Especially pissed is Mac, Alex's childhood friend and co-founder of Hell House LLC. Joining them is Tony, their tech guy, and Paul, who mostly stays behind the camera as they film their setup process. Alex's girlfriend Sarah is also there, and she's shown to be much livelier and more playful than the nervous wreck getting interviewed in the present. This team has been doing haunts in New York City for years, but last year's venture in Queens had some complications. Hey, hey. Thought we would never speak of Queens again. Later, they do talk about it. Apparently, they had a Lucifer scare actor who sounded like a spaghetti clown. Yeah, really thick guy. He'd be like, yeah, welcome to Lucifer's cat. <laughs> Lucifer's cat. That guy sounds awesome. That we guy. got so many, like, bad reviews on that guy. <laughs> People don't know quality. Seeking something new, Alex found the abandoned Hotel Abaddon in rural upstate New York. When you get that beautiful fall feeling, you just can't get that in the city. If the hotel's name sounds familiar, it's because Abaddon is a biblical term and can refer to either an angel of the abyss or a place of destruction. Or if you're me, you'll recognize it as the surname of Lance Reddick's character in Lost, R.I.P. Oh, it could also be that really cool wrestler in AEW. Hotel Abaddon is not only a structural hazard, it's also probably haunted. Did you see that? If not, don't worry. The movie rewinds and freeze frames for you. Even without the playback, this place clearly has some issues. There's a pentagram painted on a wall in the basement right next to a pile of books. What are those books? This one's a Bible. Yeah, that's definitely a Bible. Oops, all Bibles. Basement Bibles. Despite its desecration, this place has got potential. They plan for a nice flow of traffic that ends with guests exiting through the storm cellar doors. And it only takes them a week to get electricity up and running, which is when they start staying the night in rooms upstairs. Yeah, no thanks. When writer-director Stephen Cognetti started working on Hell House in 2011, it took place in a much more conventional haunted house. Production pivoted when they found the Waldorf Hotel in Lehigh, Pennsylvania, which was and continues to operate as a seasonal attraction. Get ready to feel pure, real fear. 
Angie Moyer, creator of the real-life haunt, joined production as set designer, helping them dress the place as needed, even though it was plenty creepy all on its own. If they never find us again, maybe they'll find our footage. Hell House was shot on location in 2014, over 10 days with a crew of only about a dozen people. The mixed found footage and documentary style was inspired by two things Cognetti loved, the Australian found footage film Lake Mungo and the long-running news show 60 Minutes. The team installs a closed-circuit camera system, but the cameras won't work in the basement for some reason. An evil reason? Since they're planning on having a half-naked chick chained up down there for a scene, they settle on doubling one of their scare actors as a bouncer. We're gonna need an actor down there anyways. So why not someone that can toss out, you know, people like Paul that want to get a little rapey with, uh, with their actor. He's got a point. Lots of cam op characters in found footage films are annoying. The usual example is TJ Miller in Cloverfield. Paul is no exception. Dude's main character trait is constantly trying to get his dick wet. Sarah's the only chick in the house and, uh... <laughs> Alex don't like Sharon, if you know what I mean. And that doesn't stop him from camera creeping on Sarah during panty time, but he still hopes for other options to arrive. We got the new actors coming tomorrow, so hopefully one of them's bonable. At least his blue ball bedroom vlogs give us some really good scares, like this one with a ghost lady, and an even better one later on. The new scare actors arrive, and Paul hones in on a target for his endless boner. Melissa, who will be playing the chained up chick in the basement. Are we absolutely certain that she can't be topless? Her clown bodyguard will be played by Joey Scheffler, as long as he can keep his eye on the prize. We learn that Joey survived opening night. He's the clown seen running away in that YouTube video. But nine days later, he was found dead, which I guess will count now, since we never see it, but this is when we learn about about it. Melissa's done some research and knows about this place's weird history. Things kept happening to the guests here that forced them to shut the place whoa, down. Whoa, 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 whoa. Interviews in the documentary tell us about the hotel's previous owner, Andrew Tully. He led a cult and may or may not have built the Hotel Abaddon as a portal to hell. In 1989, a woman and her daughter disappeared after checking in, and the subsequent rumors ruined the hotel's business. A few months later, Tully went out of business himself, and since they show a photo of his death, I'll go ahead and put him on the count. All of this is news to everyone but Alex, who's been keeping that info hidden from his friends and partners. He'd rather they focus on set deck, like these creepy clowns, who they make it clear cannot move. It's a really great mask, and I, I just don't think we should waste it on a dummy that doesn't move. They start test touring the place, showing off things we saw in the YouTube video. The repeated imagery between the YouTube video, the still photography, and footage like this is great at situating you inside the house. That goes a long way for a found footage movie about a haunt. Paul runs into the clown mannequin away from its basement post at the top of the stairs. Huh, what's down there, little buddy? Holy fuck! Oh, Jesus fucking Christ! That's gotta be one of my favorite jump scares, up there with the sinister tapes. Paul thinks it's Tony fucking with them, but he finds Tony on the other side of the house. When they return to the stairs, the clown mannequin is gone. He's back where he's supposed to be. What the fuck?! The gang plays the footage back, and it's great to see their reactions. Oh my god. But they still ultimately write it off as cameraman Paul playing a prank on them. With 11 days until opening night, the haunt is ready enough for a head-mounted recorded tech test. Flashing light warning here, since it's stroby as all hell when Paul begins to realize they may have more dummies and mannequins than they paid for. How many freaks did we have? He fights his way out of the stroby nightmare and pukes in a panic, which wasn't scripted. Actor Gore Abrams got so worked up during the take, he actually did vomit on the spot. Despite having enough paranormal evidence to get their own discovery show, Alex and Mac continued to doubt a secret world, even with that freaky clown continually moving around. It's a fucking mannequin. Although they did have a mannequin for scenes when it was sitting in the basement, they had trouble keeping it upright, so it's actually not a mannequin here. Depending on the shot, it's either Danny Bellini, who played Alex, or Jared Hacker, who played Tony. Before Paul and Mac can put away the evil toys, they find Sarah sleepwalking, or rather, sleep standing, and full on sleep muttering in tongues. Sarah. Sarah, you okay? The ghosts must have been reading ahead in the script, because her demonic dialogue is a later line from her interview played backwards. When I got to the front door, the police arriving. Sarah's been getting a little Blair Witchy for a while now, but this latest spell of hers is accompanied by that clown teleporting all around the hotel. Instead of running out the front door and never coming back again, they flee to their living quarters upstairs. Paul records another Betty Bye vlog before going to sleep. He wakes up to a screeching noise and turns on a light, but doesn't see the ghost lady sitting behind him until well after a minute. <laughs> he hides under the covers, but that doesn't make her disappear. It just gets her interested in it. Very interested. Oh fuck, this is actually terrible. Terrifying. And no matter how long he hides from her, the problem doesn't fix itself. I think the scene is terrifying, and an alternate version is just as scary, since it uses that goddamn clown instead of a ghost lady. Maybe they had to reshoot it because of Paul's gross loogie waterfall there. What the fuck, dude? Paul disappears overnight, and things are concerning when they give him a call. 
Hmm, that's not how he usually screams when he answers the phone. With Paul gone, Tony's promoted from B-Unit to lead cam op. He and Mac go on a wild Paul chase, following noises into the world's creepiest basement. The clowns down there seem to turn their heads to look at them, even though earlier they stressed that they can't move. It's a dummy, his head doesn't move, so they ought to be facing in the same direction. Hell House's creepy clown mannequin was an instant hit with fans, and would go on to become a staple of the series. According to producer Joe Bandelli, that was never the intention. The mannequin was just another prop. The clown was never Ever meant to be the like one of the bigger characters, but it just took on a life of its own. They find Paul against another wall, chilling in his socks and not saying a word. It leaves Tony terrified and wanting to cancel the haunt the night before it opens. When Alex refuses, Tony quits, but is convinced to come back by Mac in a nice magic hour shot. He tells him a secret about Alex that we don't hear. You don't understand everything, all right? That clown mannequin is like a chill dude once you get to know him. The movie never fully reveals what Mac said to Tony, and even Alex's actor Danny Bellini was never clued in on his secret. I find that frustrating frustrating and kind of a loose end. Whatever it was, it's good enough to inspire a survivor-style confessional from Tony, who's back in the game. Okay. Maybe it has something to do with Hell House LLC's troubling finances that are hinted at. Yeah, well, Alex didn't want to spend any money on moving props this year, so we're stuck with this one right here. But I don't see why that would be enough to bring Tony back after all of, you know, this. On opening night, they have a staff meeting that Paul sleeps through. I would not want to be back in that bed, my man. But I guess it's better than being in that basement, like Melissa, whose chains only have a single key that they give to Joey the Clown Sir. Just setting yourselves up for success, huh, guys? Whatever, though. The line outside is long and Hell House is ready to go. Open the doors! That leads us right back to the beginning as we see the original YouTube upload again. It's easy to lose him in all the footage, but the paying customer behind that particular particular camera is director Stephen Cognetti himself. Look back at me and say, I think we're next. I think we're next. It's exciting. The elaborate tour sequence involved a hundred extras and required a lot of piecemeal coverage, even though it convincingly plays like real time. Take one. Well, wait till we call action, guys. Almost immediately, shit gets unreal. Sarah says she saw Paul milling about, and in the basement, cloaked figures suddenly appear. They ain't on Hell House payroll, but they bout to be all over Melissa's soul. Recovered guest footage shows the moment Joey runs away with the only key, leaving Melissa chained up and screaming. Are you the ghost cultists attack face first, presumably killing Melissa and 10 non-staff victims that round out the night's death toll, as mentioned in the news article at the beginning of the film. Mac frantically ushers out as many guests as he can until the front door locks itself shut. He tells Tony to hang a left at the ghost woman and clear out the basement, but a supernatural force slams that door too. Now I'll add Tony to the count as well, killed off screen by the supernatural haunt crashers. Mac doubles back for Sarah and directs her towards the attic. They find Alex still alive, but nobody expects the hellish inquisition. As Sarah escapes, Mac gets dogpiled by demons and left for dead. Thanks to the durability of GoPros, we also witness Alex's death, an echo of Andrew Tully's and a foreshadowing of Joey Scheffler's. These ghosts could stand to mix things up a bit. In the present, Diane Graves asks Sarah how she managed to escape. She tells them they should learn for themselves by breaking into the Abaddon, then leaves to take a nap in the hotel they're at. There's just one problem. There isn't a Sarah Havel staying here. Uh-oh. Diane and her cameraman, played by producer Joe Bandelli, leave to go look at the Abaddon. Mitchell, who might be an intern or something, finishes watching the footage Sarah gave them. It shows that after fleeing the attic, Sarah picked up a camera and found Paul standing by the front door. She gives him a hug, finally giving him physical contact with a woman, but he repays the favor by pummeling her with an extreme close-up until the dark forces call cut. She's dragged away, and I'm assuming isn't included in the newspaper's tally of 15. After all, if her death was known and publicized, I feel like it might have been mentioned by Diane Graves. That just leaves Paul to fulfill a kill prophesized in the framing device. So he said the first body they came across was one of the Hell House members. He couldn't say which one. Paul is killed by a piece of glass thanks to the evil spirits haunting the hotel. It's done off screen, but he slides into frame to show us the aftermath. Diane doesn't know about these final deaths, so she has no problem barging into the abandoned hotel. Upstairs is a room with the same number Sarah told them to find her in. And even though we just saw her killed in footage from five years ago, they find her sitting on the bed, looking alive and well. Oh, uh, well, never mind. This ghostly twist was cheekily foreshadowed way earlier during Sarah's interview. I'm in a better place now. The movie ends with the door slamming shut on Diane and her cam op, and the cloak fan club going to town on them like room service. How many people chickened out of life thanks to Hell House's scares? Let's find out and get to the numbers.
20 people died in Hell House LLC. Of those, 10 were men, 7 were women, and 3 were unknown remainders based on a number in a news report. That gives us this pie chart, which has never been seen before, although 9 other kill counts have featured 20 deaths, just with different distributions. With a runtime of 91 minutes, Hell House had a kill on average every 4.55 minutes. I'll give the Golden Chainsaw for coolest kill to Melissa and the guests. It's rare for an off-screen kill to get this award, but I think everything leading up to it was scary enough to make it the most memorable. Interestingly, the director's cut shows Melissa's kill much more explicitly. Her body is shown slipping into a hole straight to hell, which they accomplished using a green screen and simple comping. Cool stuff, but I think the ambiguous final version works just as well. The almost shutty for lamest kill will go to Tony, even though his death was kind of the same thing. I just think that as a main character, he should have gotten something unique and on screen. And that's it. Hell House LLC came out on VOD in 2015 and has become a cult favorite. Next week, we move from Haunt to High Rise as I look at Evil Dead Rise. But until then, I'm James A. Janice. This has been The Kill Count. Hey everyone, thanks a lot for watching this Kill Count on Hell House LLC. I hope you all had a happy new year and are off to a good start with 2024. I know last week was the first Kill Count of the new year, but you know, it's still got that fresh new year feel to it, right? You're still trying to stick to those resolutions. You're still like marking down stuff that you're trying to keep track of. At least I know I am, I hope. Uh, I, I say that as I film this, like, uh, mid-December. If your resolution is to see more cute dogs, here you go! I'm helping out! Right, Molly? Molly, you're so- you're so fucking cute. You are painfully cute. You hurt me with how cute you are, and you don't even know. Molly wants to remind you that every Monday morning I do a little live stream on the channel. I go over horror news from the previous week and tell you updates about dead meat. That's every Monday live at 9 a.m. Pacific, 12 noon Eastern. Check it out, they're a lot of fun. Molly and I would also like to thank some patrons like Dominique Dominguez, Jaden and Maggie, Nick Milhauser, PJ, like pajamas, Sammy Dorman, Ty Bateman, Andrew, Andrew Fouts, Brad Ray, Keegan Cole, and Leighton Goodall. Thanks everyone, be good people.